a little late. Um, The last time I was lecturing, we were talking. I was talking about um, back end of the service. Let me and so we're talking about. Um, Next to the back end of the service. And <clears throat> talking in particular about Firebase and Firestore. Um, and we'll look back a little bit. Um, you know, we had various ways of. Um, reading data from Firebase, um, event listeners, which allow us to um, get updates um, as the data on the database is updated. Um, and yeah, early on, an example where I was using a regular really by hand and then pass in that with the string and then we're trying to read it out as an object. The object would be that value to be a number. And, and so we're going to get value to one so it gets them updated. Um, and if we're listening to updates and starting longer updates, we can just um, Remove that listener. There's various options you can use. Um, so we can order when I read it, mobile values, we can order them um, a limit to a few. Um, and we get that. Uh, um, and again, we're creating in the Firebase objects, getting it basically um, <clears throat> in reference to the particular location in that tree. Um, and then we're looking for what happens when things are updated um, and then when the operation is canceled. Yeah, we need to have the constructor so when we read it, it can be created for us and then data put into it. And now when I say limit the first two, right, add the listener, then I just get the, the first two names in that list. Or it's surprising. Um, when I say last two, well, Again, I get the last two names in the list. Right, again, just if, if you know SQL, then it's pretty standard to be able to order data in this way. Um, all right, so various options we have for reading the data from the uh, Firebase database. When you, if you're used to doing SQL database, when you go to one of these no SQL databases, you find that you have to structure your data differently because of the performance characteristics of, of a no SQL database. Um, you know, so here I'm using one of their examples, and so you're looking at trying to store. Messages in, say, a chat room. Um, 
and you're, you're keeping all of that together. So in the message, in the message you got who the sender was, um, in the message, um, which in a normal database is what you want to do. But here the problem is, um, say we want to find all messages sent by a particular user. Um, to do that, we're going to have to download um, each message and each message contains both the user and the message. Um, and so that's going to take a long time. We have to go through the entire list. So they, they um, talk about separating the data. Um, All right, so store the information about the data um, in one place, and the actual messages in another place, um, and then perhaps the participants in that chat in a different place. So now, if you want to find all messages from a particular user, you can then you know, scan for a, a, a smaller list to find those participants, and then later go look at the messages. So it's just a reminder that these databases work differently and so you have to structure the information differently in them. Um, yeah, and if you're used to an SQL database, um, you can have triggers on the back end to do some work. Um, and usually when you have a server, when you write it yourself, the information goes to a server and then the server may process the data, check it for various things, and then put it into a database. Um, but when you're using the back end of the service, you're pretty much talking directly to the database. The only processing you want to do, validation you want to do, again, is harder in the DAS system. And Firebase allows us to um, but having Java code run on a server um, when you do a write. Um, so maybe you want to check the data, validate it. Maybe you want to take the data and put it in different places. Um, you can also um, authenticate you, require that you to be authenticated before they can access the access database. And we do that um, looking at the rules. Um, and here, right, and basically they're saying no one's authorized until they get authorized. Um, and then there's right, an authentication part of the uh, dashboard on Firebase we can then indicate how we want them to actually authenticate. Um, and so here I've selected email and password. You see it's enabled. Um, and we need to add, you know, dependency to the Firebase authentication. And now, um, you know, get, I get my authorization instance and then I'm signing in with my password, um, email password. And that's it. You know, that's how we can then um, authenticate and have users log in. So for creating applications, right, you want them to. We don't want anyone to like connect the database. So far, so good. Let me say, Ross, where did my chat window go? This is. I haven't quite figured out why this happens, but whenever I share my screen, all of a sudden, 
a list of people in the class and the group chat goes away. Now it's back. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of Firebase is that um, you know Google does allow you to right, you know from inside Android Studio request that they you know run test your application on real devices. Um, and this is the bane of Android is that there are many, many devices, many different sizes and shapes. Um, and so it's very useful to test your applications, not just on a device, but on multiple different devices. Make sure that it works properly, the screen's right. Um, I used to have a photo of the devices that one company was using just Android and it was just room full of shells. And I misplaced it. Um, so something to keep in mind when you're doing Android development. Okay, and that's all I want to talk about um, as back end of service. And so I'm going to talk about um, just some UI patterns. When we, when we create a new project, there's a whole list of different activities. Um, and we're primarily looking at the basic activity, but there are quite a few um, other templates they use to have to get started. And I want to look at a few. And this is, what can I say? Um, Android is changing over time and the pace seems to be picking up. Um, you know, we went from Java to Kotlin, they've added um, Jarkus components, so we got room and models, a few models. And, and so we're going back further, they added fragments. And in the future, there's going to be, um, you know, let's combine or compose library coming in. And so these templates they use are evolving over time too. So the templates I've looked at have changed considerably from what they were last year. It doesn't mean what we did last year doesn't work, but they've decided that this might be a better way of actually doing it using more of the, of the tools. So a very, you know, very common pattern is we've got, you know, the bottom here, we've got, you know, basically buttons we can press and it all change the view, right? So it's like each one of these is a different, different view. Um, I believe this should be Right. So they tap each button, right? We, we get a completely different view. Um, and of course, the way this works behind the scenes is that um, each time I press one of these buttons, right, it, it shows up a different fragment. Um, the question is, how can we do this? Um, what's involved? And we can do this several ways. You know, one is we can um, do it by a, a new project. And so we've got the bottom navigation activity. And we can also um, create, a, create it using a new activity. Um,
Now, here's one of the things that's changed. Um, so when we, we create this in the template, um, our view for, for this main activity is basically two elements. Well, in the container, inside the container, there's a nav view, which is basically the view down here. And then this host fragment is basically all the, the contents you can see up here. Right. Um, now, when we look at this navigation view, um, I want to point out where right, it contains a menu object, menu reference. And then menu reference is going to contain um, right, all the information for each one of these tabs. Right, so um, here's our menu, right? So I'm looking at the text view as opposed to the graphic view, um, right? So there's, it contains an ID so we can reference it, you know, basically an icon and title, right? And again, they're using um, a string resource that we should do all the time, um, right? So, you know, here is this menu comes here, right? Navigation locations, that right? goes up there. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is these drawables. Uh, uh, built in. There's, there's certain ones that come with Android that you can use. So now each one of the, when, when we click on one of these, these tabs, we need to display a different um, layout. So we need a different fragment. Um, for each tab, we also want a different fragment. And so here are layouts. We're getting three separate fragments, views, and then of course we go with the fragments. We need the fragment subclass. And so when again, this, this is everything I'm showing you was created by the template. Um, I actually haven't added any code per se. Um, and of course now. Their templates now, one of the new things with the template is when they create the fragment, they're also creating a view model to go with the template. Like I said before, they um, have introduced new, th new things to Android, eventually they, they seep into the templates. Um, so you can see how they're saying we should start using view models. Um, now the question is, when I click on all those tabs, how is that, how does that make the fragment change? And to do that, we need to go down in our resource, we have this mobile navigation. And when we look at that mobile navigation, right, um, it contains several things. It contains, this is a graphic view. It contains all of the frag, fragments. Um, and so all the fragments are combined in this group. And also we can uh, select which, which fragment should be the default when you start up. Um, and that's done by this icon up here. Um, we can also um, add more items to this with this plus button.
And now we go to the main activity. Right, it was pretty short. Um, this nav view. Um, it had reference to the menus. Um, and right, this is this nav host fragment has reference to mobile navigation. And you know, then for app for configuration, we give it a list of all the um, segments, basically. So if you want to add more tabs, what do we do? Well, um, you have to create more fragment views, more subclasses, make the fragments work. Um, the menus then need to be updated at, to show list all the all the um, new fragments. Add that fragment to the mobile navigation, um, and then we need to add it to this in the main activity. And one more person showed up. And the okay, any questions? No, everyone's quiet. We can add up to five items. And when you've got more than three, you only show the text for the one which is selected. Yeah, let's just show the icons. Um, you know, Google provides a number of icons you can download and use. Uh, oh, that's the, uh, I need to and then when you have icons you want to add to the project, um, whether it's actually a bit image or a vector image. Um, with a new, and then you can either add, depending on which one you have, uh, Google provides vector assets instead of a bit. And you have to be somewhat careful about the layout. Um, the difficulty is the fragment right, can't go all the way down because you've got this space for the tabs, and you've got this space right, for the header, and so you have to make sure that we don't go down too far. And so when I added this button, um, I need to make sure I added 52 pixels right, in the bottom because that was the, that's the width of the the tab on the bottom. So far so good. Uh, can we just repeat this, Professor? Say that again. Can you just repeat this bit about what is the fifty-two? Yeah, the number fifty-two. I'm sure. Talk so about. Sure. So when you go, um, when you go to add things to your fragment, you're going to get 
you know, that entire range to add things. But the problem is um, the bottom part of the screen here is going to be covered up with like this, a space for the, the tab on the bottom. It will become, if you ever do this, it'll become clear because if you put your, if you put a button uh, for this, if you put a button to here, right, when you run it, um, it's going to be actually underneath here. Is that better? So, uh, so, so the fragment is taking the space in the bottom of the screen? Right. So the, uh, that's why we have to give some extra space at the bottom? Say it again. So uh, we have to give some extra space at the bottom there? Yes, exactly. Okay, understood. Thank you, Professor. Another one of the um, templates. Okay. No, it was this navigation draw it side up from the side. Um, and again, we can select, you know, from that menu and get So in both cases, right, in the previous example, we had basically a bunch of tabs in the bottom. So that was just a way of having a menu item and you could select about item in the menu and that would then select which fragment to use. The same thing here, we kept now that menu instead of being displayed in the bottom of a series of tabs, it's gonna be displayed right in that drawer that slides out. Um, and then this particular um, template adds two more features. Um, one is like this button, the solving button you can add to, um, you can press and then it forms some sort of action. Um, and then it gives you another potential menu at the top to do something else, right? And this, but most of it's all the hamburger menu up here is used to bring that um, drawer out. But again, the basic idea is we have a menu um, and for each item in the menu, we've got a fragment. So when we select one of the items in the menu, we, get, we see that fragment. Um, so it's just a different way of accomplishing the same task. And again, you have the template to do it. Or we can also um, generate the template in the existing project um, with the, you know, the new menu activity, you know, like. And this template is a little more complicated to deal with. Um, the main layout is very simple. Um, there's navigation view. Um, and this nav view, right? Um, you know, this is the text from the main layout for so that navigation view. And one that has the navigation header, that's the graphics in the drawer that slides out. And the menu, 
is the list of items you want to display in that drawer. Um, you know, navigation header main is just this bracket. And so you've got your image of, and then the two texts. Um, all right, how about that? You know, the navigation main header um, it contains you know, three items you want to display home, gallery, slideshow. And this is right menu. Um, action bar. Um, and that bar main. You know, the fab button contains just that little green circle for the envelope. Um, Uh, and then this content then name. Um, now this contains the pulse fragment, um, and part of it contains a reference to mobile navigation. And the mobile navigation will play the same role it did in the previous sample, which will create how we, how we group the, the menu item. All right, so again, we've got the menu item. Um, And also, again, this is like with the start. And laying it out, um, again, notice I have, you know, the camera space down here, the housing space down there. And that's again because we have to worry about right, the navigation here. And this, at some point, these templates um, are accessible. You just have to spend some time looking at them. And tracing things down to see you know, where pieces go so you can know what pieces to modify. Um, and you're at the stage where um, you should probably start looking at them and start doing this project to see which ones might be useful um, to get very successful. Okay, any questions? Okay, no, no questions. I want to look at briefly one other template, and that's in massive detail. Um, the point of this one, there's two points. One is this is a common situation where you have some sort of list, and then you click an item on the list, and you go to a detailed view about that item. 
Um, the other point is then if you want your application to run both on a phone and a tablet, um, the master detail flow will handle it for you mainly. Um, so when you're on a phone, you have the list to be one view, click on an item, that view goes away, and then you see the detail view, and then you hit the back button, you go back to the list view. Um, on the tablet, you'll have a, um, the list view will be on the side, and when you click a particular item, it will show in the detail view on the right side. Um, I don't worry about this case um, too much anymore because um, well, how many how many students in the class have an Android tablet? A show of hands, yes, no. It's one person listening. Um, yeah, I don't think um, Android tablets are very popular. That's why I don't worry about this too much. Um, but the question becomes when you're, if you're actually going to do this, um, the problem is you're on the same application. And sometimes there's two views on the screen, sometimes there's one. And how do you view it in your code? Um, and the way they do it um, is it seems um, a little bit clunky to me is what they do is. Well, your detailed view is going to have a widget um, in it that will, will be on the screen when you're on a tablet. And that widget will not be on the screen um, at the same time as the list view on a phone. Um, and so what they do um, in Android is in your main activity, they declare this property to pane um, and then they check to see whether or not the item detail container is available right now which means it's on the screen. If it's um, not null, that means that both the list view and the detail view are shown. And so it's like this is true. Yeah. And now what they expect you to do is in your code, um, you start getting things like this where every method, method starts to become a case statement. You know, if, it, if it's too pain, you may do something this way, otherwise do it that way. Is that clear? Now I want to talk about a different way of handling that. Um, and to do that, I want to use an example of assignment that I gave um, several years ago. And the assignment was, is a game. Um, and when you started the game, you would draw circles, all these circles here. Um, and then when you're ready to play the game, um, you click on a button and then you could fling the, fling the circles and I figure what Jack supposed to do. So that you, you know, may have been trying to keep the circles from going past you from the black circle. Um, 
Uh, I guess it's making sure that they don't have a black circle. Um, but the difference is um, when I'm drawing in circles, you know, again, you put the finger on the screen and that would determine what the circle would be. And the longer you have the, the finger there, the circle get bigger and bigger. Um, and then when you play the game, you could you know, move things around by touching the screen. So depending on what state you are in, whether you're in the drawing circle state, you touch the screen to create circles. Other times, you're in the state, it would be different things. Um, the game had various states. Um, no game, um, create circles, and play game. Different states. And pause. And now we can represent this game using what we call a state machine. So here are my different states I can be in. Um, and when I'm in the no game state, there's only one action we can do is we can create a new game. And that leads us to create circles. And then when I create circles, I can put my finger on the screen. So action down, now start a circle. Action move, you know, that's when your finger's on the screen. So it goes bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally action up, you know, lift the finger up. Now the circle's at its fixed size and you take that circle and store it someplace to keep on redrawing it. When I'm done creating circles, right, I press the start button and that moves me to the um, play game state. And, right, now in the play game state, the action move actually is going to take a circle and move it. So even though it's you know, we've got the same action, right? In different states, again, the different the same action is going to be different outcomes, different things, right? And then we need time to progress. We want the circles to be moving, and so any time, every so every so often, you, you know, basically a time update. It's time to redraw yourself and move things around. And then there's an end game to bring it back to no game state. So it can represent how the game operates as a state machine. And also, if you lose all your lives, then the game's over to go to no game state. Has anyone seen state machines like this before? Yeah, good. At least one person. Um, state machines like this can be a very useful tool to think about how the program should operate. Um, people develop games, um, use state machines all the time to model um, what can happen. Mm -hmm. And once we can think about our, in this case, our game and this particular you know, state machine, in a way, as much we can, we can, we can use this to implement um, these implementations. Um, you know, one is we can use a case statement. And that's what um, the template's doing. Is a two pane variable. Basically, there are two states, either two pane or not. And that means whenever we do something, it's like, okay, first check our two pane, yes, and do this. If it's not two pane, do that. All right, so every method becomes a check which case we're in and then do the right thing. Um, we can actually create 
a class of each state, and then that class we add up methods on it representing which action you can do. Um, and then what you do instead of storing a Boolean value, you're going to store that um, object for that state object. And then your main activity is going to then call the method on that state object. And yes, yeah, so here's an example of implementation um, doing you know, just a case statement. And so, you know, when we get the action down, what do we do? Well, depending on the state we're in, we're going to do nothing if there's no game. We're going to create circles and we call the create circle down action. And we're playing a game and call a different method, right? So each, um, a lot of our methods and activity become a case statement to do the right thing depending on what state we're in as given by that variable. Okay. The other way is we can, we can create state objects. Um, so here I'm creating an interface, right? And here are the various actions we have to worry about. You know, down, move up, uh, tick tock. Um, and you know, play game state, what do we do? Well, um, on um, action move, what we want to do is, you know, given the event in the circle, um, we need to move that circle. So here is some code to actually do that. Um, and, and here is my, uh, I create circle classes and now on my action down, um, we get the XY coordinates and then we have to create our circle. Right? So the same action is also a different activity based on the state we're in. And now my state up. My state uh, is an object. Um, I start with no game state. Um, and when I click on the new game button, what we do is we change states. Um, when I click on the start game, what I do is I, you know, I create the play game state object to make the return state. Um, all right, and then. Um, my action handle action down, it just calls all right the method on the current state. Well, actually it should be current state. This is it should be current state dot action down. Yes. So if any of you have Study design patterns. This is an instance of the um, design pattern state, design the state pattern. Any questions? Another topic. Um, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, when we specify how large to make things, we can do it in different ways. Um, we can do it in pixels, density and tender pixels, scale pixels, um, and, and millimeters. So you know, some of these are, are fixed size, and these are um, relative size. You 
We can also um, uh, look at that. In general, you don't want to use, use pixels as a measurement because um, what would be showing on the screen depends upon the density, the pixel density of the actual screen. So if I can advise with you know, relatively low pixels per inch, um, you may get something this big, but now on a different device with a denser resolution screen, the same box will be um, basically going quarter the size because we now um, well, I've shrunk it half in both directions. So using p axis is not a good idea. Um, DP for D independent pixels. Um, we, when I specify something at the end by end, um, it's going to appear to be the same size um, on the screen, independent of the pixel density of the actual device. So, you know, this is the preferred way of specifying sizes in pixels. Um, scale pixels are something similar but it's for text only. And the difference is it uses the device's um, pixel density plus font preference of the user. So they want a large font or small font. And there is, um, Bitmaps, um, I'm sure you've all seen this. If you take the bitmap and enlarge it, it starts to look grainy. Um, on a small size here, it doesn't look too bad. Um, so as it gets bigger, you start to see that the image gets grainy. Um, So if, you, if you're going to provide images to be displayed on your device, you want to make sure that you do different sizes. Um, you know, multiple sizes of different devices so that if you're going to, you're going to display that on a very small device, you can use a small image. If you're on a tablet, the same thing, you can give larger space if you want a bigger image to um, display. And then you can ask the obvious question, why not just get a huge right image and then have Android downsize it for you? Um, well, doing that every time you display that on a small device, it's gonna consume CPU cycles and that can slow down the display of that um, fragment review to take a bunch of images and downsize it before you stick it in. Um, and they have, you know, various density names. Um, and the big one is for the scale factor. Um, and so again, we use a standard thing where in our resource directory, we are going to um, put images and have a directory for each different density size, density, um, and then we're going to use the same name, right, in each directory for this image, but we want to make sure the image is indeed scaled to a particular size. If you work on a team, you usually have a graphic artist to do this for you. If you're by yourself, a very small team, then you may get the job of creating images. Um, 
Yeah, I don't care about this anymore. Um, screen size is now. Um, they talk about small with you know, you know height width. Um, so now when you want to provide different layouts and these screen sizes, again, you can create different directories to layouts and then you know, different sizes of the screen and then where this landscape is posted. And this is just a general scheme that Android uses for resources where there's a layout, images, sounds, strings. Um, we can create a, you know, a directory and for different attributes for the language, um, size of the screen, you can do a directory and then put those assets um, appropriate for that particular um, description. And you can, in your manifest, um, you can specify which screen size and density is your support. Um, so if you don't want to support, you know, the tablet size or a really small device, or you know, can specify which, which one to support. And then if you put it in Android App Store, um, people with devices that you say you don't support won't see your application. Um, and of course, like I said, we can create layouts and resources for um, different screen sizes and intensities, different languages. And then we can start getting um, quite a few different layouts, right? Um, you know, if portrait, but only a large portrait, you know, landscape, normal size. Um, again, we do the same thing. We, you know, in this case, the resources, we put, you know, layouts in them. Um, and we can then, as you can see here, we do, you know, all this to modify or specify what situation this layout should be used in. And Android then picks one that best matches um, the current situation. Here is, you know, the manifest file has the, you know, that's why the screen size is little support. Um, and some of the options we have for to do so. And you know, here are all the different directories we can put in the resource part of your Android project in the core. Um, and here's all the qualifiers that we can add to the directory to you know, special situations, languages, with types. Screen sizes, right? Um, and you have to be careful. Um, the quantifiers have to be done in the right order. Um, so this one is fine. Um, but if I put these in the wrong way, then that results in error. And the order in which you have to put them is the order in which they appear here. It's really not much of a problem because it's not like you're going to string a lot of them in one place. Um,
And then there's an algorithm that Android uses to figure out what is the best match. And we'll go through the algorithm. Um, Yeah, so how do we detect the screen size? And how do we get raw detects from the screen size? Um, well, we're gonna use different layouts, right, to do much of this. So this is going to um, select the right one for us. Um, Yeah, another problem with images. Um, images have an aspect ratio when they're created. And if you're not careful and you select a different aspect ratio, um, right, you start getting a very tall, skinny dog or a really fat dog. Um, and so you need to be careful of that. And you may have noticed that the computer science web pages have this problem in images added by the office staff, and they are not quite as good with graphic arts and doing images to do that problem. Um, we can have an alias to the reference. So we can put a resource in one spot and use it in multiple places. Um, so an example of using alias, for, right, so I've got layout, and I've got one pane or two pane layout. Um, Now I've got values. Um, we want to keep those everywhere. Um, so what do we do? Well, in these values, I can now specify, oh, it's layout one pane. Um, and yeah, for infinite density. Let's lay out two pane. Um, I'm not ha I'm not repeating this XML in both places. Right. I'm basically referencing it um, here and here. And now when I call this activity, it's going to call the appropriate one again. And again, um, this one should be deleted. So I ended four minutes early. Are there any questions? So, uh, Professor, I have a question. Okay. So I just wanted to understand, uh, since we're not going to have the next assignment, so uh, are we having any change in the marking scheme for the project? No. Okay. So the one given in the syllabus is what we are going to follow? Correct. Okay. And so That's what it. happens is, since we're not having um, time four, then I just pull up the number of points we get total. 
Okay, well, I hope everyone has a nice weekend. And we'll see you on Tuesday.